What's up, guys? Welcome to Law Explaining the Interwebs. I am your host, Nick Ricada of Ricada Law, a small law firm in central Minnesota. If you're ever in Minnesota, you run into any legal issues or have any questions, please look me up. I can probably help out. All right. So let me get this mic a little closer. Today, we have a little bit of an interesting sort of subject. I am not dealing with a legal document. I am not dealing with a court opinion uh, expressly. I am dealing with some allegations, and these allegations are not even brought by law enforcement. So there's, um, there's a little bit going on here, and I have to put up this disclaimer up front. I cannot verify the facts in this allegation. I, um, I am fairly confident that the author of this post is, uh, has substantial information to back up these allegations, but I must be clear, these are allegations by a private person who has done private research. These allegations are not made by federal law enforcement or state law enforcement, and I am not accusing anyone of a crime. What I am going to do in this video is take a hypothetical view, and this is this is kind of what you do in law school, right? You create hypotheticals, and sometimes uh, the best hypotheticals come from real allegations because it's, it's people's perceptions of events. They're not so contrived and manufactured that uh, that's the stuff you often get out of a textbook. These are real life hypotheticals here. Um, I am leaving the people's names, uh, in, in this thing, but I have removed their personal identifiable information like addresses and stuff like that, that you can find on your own. I'm not going to be involved in that at all. So, uh, the disclaimer of course, is that these are allegations by a private individual who has done private research. Uh, I do not make these allegations. I merely relay them. And for the purpose of this video, these allegations will be accepted as true merely for the purpose of education on what could be the next steps. And this is kind of an important case, uh, in my opinion, because it involves something that flies under the radar very frequently, and that's the abuse of vulnerable adults um, or even vulnerable children and, uh, and, and taking advantage of them in various ways. So if this is true, this is actually a really terrible, terrible crime. <laughs> and, and if it's true, hopefully law enforcement will take a look at it. But again, uh, I have no idea, and I am not... I don't have the authority to do anything about this. Uh, one, it's not in my jurisdiction. Two, I'm not law enforcement. And three, I don't really talk to cops at all unless I'm telling them to pound sand. So that being said, let's get started uh, with just, I'm not going to drink a lot tonight, but I am going to have just a little nip of Maker's Mark, which is Kentucky whiskey. And if you go some, what do we got? Kentucky bourbon, I should say. Ugh. And I got this glass in Kentucky. These are good things. So we got some Maker's Mark and a glass that I purchased in Kentucky made out of rocks from probably Mexico because the glass is like $4. Anyway... <laughs> Uh, this video, if you can't tell from the thumbnail and the description and everything else is about a guy named Chris Chan. And I say before anyone jumps on me on that, I say a guy named Chris Chan, uh, Chris is actually, I have heard, I don't know anything about this person. Okay. I am not a Chris Chan fan follower. I know about this person through peripheral conversations, but no personal experience. If I understand correctly, uh, Chris Chan actually identifies as Christine, a male to female trans person. I don't know if there has been any operation or hormone therapy or anything like that, but that is the chosen identity of Chris Chan, as far as I can tell, to be Christine. However, I am going to refer throughout this video to... Uh, to this person as Chris Chan, because Chris Chan is the internet personality 
that is known and uh and christine is is not so chris chan is the persona and that is no disrespect to the person and their their personal decisions um although when you see this document you may understand that there might be some issues with those decisions uh, but yeah, so don't jump on me for pronouns or anything like that. I'm using Chris Chan as it is, as it is the popular identification moniker of this persona. And that's what's important here. Mm. Got that Kentucky bite. Okay, so a little bit of background information. For the purposes of this video, this is about all you need. Chris Chan is a person who lives in Virginia. So we are going to be looking at Virginia laws. Uh, Joshua Wise and Stephen Boyd, the two who are alleged to have committed extort potential extortative acts against Chris Chan, do not live in Virginia. One lives in Kentucky, one lives in California. So we're going to be looking at Virginia law because that's where the acts took place. We will be looking at federal law because that is where... Um, because these acts took place technically across state lines, and I believe they could potentially be charged both in Virginia and federally. Uh, and Virginia does have an extradition policy um, for any crime, misdemeanor or higher. So anything other uh, above a petty misdemeanor, you can be extradited to Virginia for. So if Virginia wanted to issue a, uh, a citation to these guys or a demand to appear... Uh, they actually could do that um, under their under their extradition extradition treaty or not treaty their extradition policy because uh, these would be felony charges. So if there is determined to be evidence, Virginia could potentially enforce against these guys and the feds definitely could based on what has happened. Definitely could if, of course, there was enough evidence to accuse them of a crime and probable cause to arrest and all of that. Um, again, this is hypothetical, so I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to gloss things here. Oh, Chris Chan is also, uh, he's a longtime internet personality and the creator of a character called Sonichu, which is a combination of Sonic and Pikachu. And it is alleged that Chris Chan is autistic. And, um, when I say it is alleged that he is autistic, I mean it in the diagnosis sense. However, I don't know that there's a diagnosis, but I don't mean it in a pejorative way, and I don't mean it in an internet weird compliment way that, uh, that he's like autistic because he's super good at figuring something out or sticking to a particular task, and I don't mean that he's autistic as in he's dumb. That's not, it's, it's actually alleged that he is actual autism, and it is potentially alleged that both Joshua Wise and Stephen Boyd also are autistic. Uh, but there's a little less information about that. So I just want you guys to keep that in mind as we go through this, that those are kind of some extenuating factors, and I'll talk about them a little bit as we get through. But those would be really specific things and not relevant to whether charges should be brought, but they could become, excuse me, they could become relevant to whether or not a conviction should occur, okay? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to read Null's post. So this post is from Kiwi Farms. It was made by Null, who is the owner or operator or webmaster for Kiwi Farms, whatever whatever title that is. I'm, I'm too old to understand that stuff. Uh, but Null is the guy. Null has made this post. And Null, if I understand correctly, is in possession of most of the evidence uh, in, involved here. So if you have questions about this stuff, uh, I will answer what I can, of course, but um, Null and the Kiwi Farms Forum is probably the primary source you want to go to, and that may taint your opinion a little bit about this, but uh, you know, I, I've spoken to Null on this, and just based on, on that conversation, I'm pretty confident that he has uh, at least enough to back up the claims that he has made here if not more, in pretty credible evidence. But uh, again, that would be for a judge and a jury uh, and law enforcement officials to determine, not us. We're going to take it all as true, and uh, let's let's go. I'm rambling. I'm rambling. We're 10 minutes in. I haven't done anything. Okay, so I'm going to read this. 
Joshua Wise and Stephen Boyd, the Chris Chan extortionists and the end of Evangelion. I had many ideas of how I do this inform dole this information out, but I figure at this point I'll just tell everyone what happened. I'm writing this post for a broader audience and will be explaining things so people outside the CWC community can understand it. Christian Weston Chandler, legally Christine, has been trolled online for over a decade. That's Chris Chan. He is the author of a comic book series called Sonichu, a character who is based on the Sonic on Sonic the Hedgehog and Pikachu, a Pokemon. Most of the trolling that has happened to him involves Sonichu in some way. People frequently believe Chris is falling for the same tricks every time, but that's not the case. He was continually manipulated into doing stuff for women, but the way he was introduced to women changed all the time. This is also a good time to tell everybody that most of the funny CWC content throughout the years was not his own original ideas. It's all BS. People told him what to do and he did it. The girlfriend needs you to be a man, record yourself yelling, or you won't impress Casey if you don't do the singing contest. So if you have some fond memory of Chris from the years gone by that revolve around this, his antics, I'm sorry to say there is no Santa. It was trolls all the way down. What that does say is that Chris is extremely gullible. If someone tells him something, he believes it. Gullibility is a common symptom of autism. I know it's unpopular to excuse certain things that Chris does just on merit of him being autistic, but this is about where you can draw that line. He believes BS people tell him because he is gullible. After Bob, his father died, the old guard basically all gave up. Marvin is still around, but he's basically just a librarian for something long dead. Chris, in the meantime, had enough exposure to casual BS trolls he, uh, that, that he built up sort of an immune system. He would just ignore everyone. That really boring period of time a few years ago where nothing happened, that was Chris immune to the outside. But things change and viruses adapt. In particular, Barb shopping hit a critical mass and she restructured, restructured her consumer debt into a reverse mortgage. Barb, I infer, is Chris's mother and caretaker. And if you don't know what a reverse mortgage is, that's where the bank gives you money, uh, but the promise is that you're going to give them your property when you die. And there are specific requirements about it. Uh, if you ever want to talk about a reverse mortgage, um, they got a bad rap in the 80s. They've kind of gotten a little better. And for some people, they're absolutely a fantastic choice. But uh, know that there are two different ways you can do it. You can do a lump sum payout of a reverse mortgage, or you can do a reverse mortgage annuity which is where they take the value of your house, they take your age, I believe you have to be 65, maybe it's 62 and a half, but I believe 65 years of age or older to do a reverse mortgage, and then they take the life expectancy, uh, which I think is about 80, and they, um, they annuitize the payments of the value of your house over the life expectancy years. If you outlive your life expectancy, you can earn more money. If you if you do not live your life expectancy, you earn considerably less. But in either case, your estate does not retain ownership of the mortgage of the home. Uh, the home is mortgaged to the bank, and the bank takes it upon your death. So it's very good for people who don't want to leave things to their descendants and need income, or if their descendants are unable to support them for some reason, uh, a reverse mortgage can be an option there. I'm I'm not advertising reverse mortgages here. What I'm doing, and by the way, no. <laughs> uh, what I'm doing is just trying to explain that um, I I worked in banking for several years, so uh, I know what they are, and you guys might not. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. So yes, that's right. So when she dies, the estate is insolvent, and I've redacted the address. His home will be reclaimed by the bank. Chris makes about $1,300 per month off of his social security disability income, and Barb takes $900 off of it immediately. She continually stresses to him the house is at risk of foreclosure and he needs to make more money. So, he, so that's a lie. <laughs> there may be some issues there. So he starts getting desperate for money, and one of the people to buy from him is a guy named Joshua Wise. In September of last year, a very, very mentally ill person is in direct contact with a very, very gullible man. The virus, using money, found his way past Chris's immune system. Joshua Wise uses Chris to insert a couple of his own ideas. Chris draws a bunch of edgy Nazi slash school shooter stuff. He draws a pony named Cunty Nuggets, which I, I can't help but laugh at. That sort of nonsense. Eventually, the forum chases him out for being an unfunny uh, F word, and that's it, right? 
Months later, the same sort of odd, unsettling behavior is demonstrated by Chris again. We begin to wonder who the new idea guy is, and I make the following proclamation. So this is Null quoting himself from before. If we were to find out someone is blackmailing Chris, I will aggressively contact state and federal law enforcement to see that to it that someone goes to prison for it. Stop taking my favorite uh, pejorative for mentally handicapped person who just wants to sit at home and play with Legos and turning him into an effing marionette for your BS power fantasies. Back to Null's current post. While prescient as ever, it turns out this is exactly what's happening. Joshua Wise and Stephen Boyd, along with a person from Ca Canada I'm not naming and a totally unknown person, uh, isolate Chris into a Discord channel. And if I understand right, the totally unknown person is a little less unknown, but is not located in the U.S. and has not disclosed a name. This is, so in brackets here, this is the only funny part, so if you're planning on laughing during this post, laugh now. Joshua Wise and Stephen Boyd send Chris Photoshop pictures of a weapon on the moon and pictures of riots from Ferguson, warning that they could destroy CWCville, the fictional city Sonichu lives in where Chris is the mayor. Chris believes this is a real threat. <laughs> and that is, it's mildly funny, not that he believes uh, this sort of, fiction it's funny that they created this fiction and a laugh track so naturally once they have chris believing that they have chris confessing to being a pedophile and raping his mother once they have those confessions they threaten to release it to the public if he doesn't record himself defecating on the floor and punching himself in the face until tears and snot are running down his chin at one point they ask chris to punch his mother which he does though he claims he does it lightly so this is the point, uh, this, is, this is where things start to get really scary, right? Like there's a difference between convincing people um, to believe things that are, you know, trolling people into believing something that might not be true or, or playing on their fantasies or fears. Uh, it's an entirely different thing to start getting people to um, cause harm to themselves or harm to others. Once they have exerted complete control over Chris, his beliefs and actions, they begin to quench their avarice. Little dramatic. Threatening again to release the videos, it starts off as small gifts, like Steam gift cards, but it continues. In the first few months of 2018, they managed to obtain more than $6,000 in Steam codes, prepaid Visa debit cards, and GameStop toys and electronics sent directly to their house. Don't believe me? I've redacted the addresses here, guys. Um... You know, if you want to look them up, you look them up. But again, for the purposes of YouTube and, uh, and, and the internet rules of doxing and all that stuff, I'm not going to release the information, but uh, it's, it's out there for people who want to find it. Stephen Boyd, posing as Gwyn Makoto, uh, redacted Kentucky, is their family house. I, Null, have been in touch with his mother, who lied to cover him. Uh, this is one of many. Both of them receive brand new PS Vitas and games and accessories. So here's just an, an order confirmation or shipment confirmation um, to Chris Chan Sonichu, and I've redacted his email address. And uh, this was in March of 2018. I redacted the order and tracking number for obvious doxing purposes. Shipped to Gwen Makoto, and it's the same address that uh, that is alleged up here. And that address does not belong to Gwen Makoto, that address belongs to Stephen Boyd's family. Now, my understanding is that Stephen Boyd is a 25-year-old male, potentially who has autism as well, who lives with his mother. Uh, there's a little more on that later that we'll get to. Oh, and... Um, yeah, I guess, I guess talk, to, talk to Null maybe, or ask questions on the forum if you want to know the details of the phone call. But uh, he did relay them to me and talked about what was up with the, the lying bit. But I don't, I'm, you know, the, it's not my job to pass along someone else's words in that way. So uh, I'm, I'm sure you could find it on the forum or, or through uh, something else Null has posted. Chris was smart enough to keep every receipt for things he bought them. Here's some gift cards he sent to Joshua Wise. So uh, these pictures have gift cards and receipts uh, in them. And how can I be sure it's him? Well, here's a spooky picture of a man in a gas mask that Joshua Wise sent Chris to scare him. 
Unrelated photo of Joshua Wise next to it, third on right, holding a child. For the record, I tried calling Wise's mother, who is a nurse, but she wouldn't answer. There's a lot of logs and images and videos we save. So this is this is the interesting thing here. Um, again, I have not reviewed any of this stuff, but from the allegations, according to Null, uh, they have they have logs of everything that these guys did, their exact communications to Chris Chan, uh, I believe through Discord, among potentially other communication mediums. Um, they've got receipts, they've got pictures. I believe they have the videos that uh, these guys are using to extort Chris and all of that stuff. So, because we did save it, all of it. Chris gave us access to his Discord account and we pulled every effing thing from their servers. I'll try to get them out to people eventually. I'd probably do it right now, but I'm on my laptop and I'm waiting for my desktop to arrive in the mail, but I did promise I'd post this by the 10th. The aftermath of this is that now, thanks to things directly told to Chris by Joshua Wise, Chris literally believes in alternate dimensions he can travel to. Chris believes every cartoon world has its own dimension. Chris believes Ted Bundy is part Sonichu and framed. Chris believes he and his father are also part Sonichu. A bunch of other stuff I can't even effing, effing remember right now. I also cannot express my unbelievable frustration with people in general. The only reason why we even have this figured out is because of Anna McLaren, who put off contact contacting the police for over a month to give her time for her college finals, then refused to help us at all. Rocky, Chris's church counselor, refused to contact the police and instead wanted Chris put up in a home. Regardless of your opinion on that, contacting the police would be a priority, not the sped home. Uh, I don't know if that's like a pejorative special ed. <laughs> I'm not down on all the lingo, but that's what I would guess. And and that's a shame. Um, and based on based on this, Chris probably should be taken away from his mother if if she's taking away his social security disability income uh, and not paying like a mortgage expense with it because she has a reverse mortgage. So, but again, that's, that's kind of ancillary to all of this. I personally contacted Green County Sheriff Stephen S. Smith, who refused to do anything, saying that it's Chris's choice to defecate on the floor, which is not really true all the time. I contacted the FBI first through the IC3.gov contact form. Then I took the report and put it in the hands of an FBI agent who met me in person about a bomb hoax terrorist Samuel Collingwood Smith had done in 2016, just to try and shake that tree further. Chris did eventually print my IC3 report and hand it in to the station himself, alone. That's actually how we got into contact. Chris just pulled my phone number off the report. Since then, it has been dead air. No one has contacted Chris. No one has contacted me. No one has done anything. I get that $6,000 isn't the white-collar crime that brings down the hammer, but we're talking about effing unhinged lunatics who are coaxing mentally ill people into punching themselves. It's not even an effing hard case. I have the GD names and addresses. Just put one of the people in a box, and you'll start squealing on the other immediately. So F Joshua Wise, F Stephen Boyd, F Anna McLaren, F Rocky, F Green County, F the entire United States. You people are all poop, and I hope you rot in hell. Notes. Uh, there's a debate over whether which Boyd it is. The Boyd family has five children. Two are minors. One is military. One lives a few miles away from the redacted residence. That's Nathan Boyd. The last is 25 and at home, Stephen Boyd. Big thanks to at Marvin and at the captain and a third friend. This post is completely free to republish. Attribution is not required, although we've given it here. You do not need to ask for my permission to use any or all of this message. And then for more information available upon request to any U.S. law enforcement officer, null at kiwifarms.net. So if you are a federal law enforcement officer, and I know that some of you do uh, watch this channel, if you are, uh, please contact null uh, and, and find out if there's something here um, because based on this allegation, I see an obvious crime of extortion and potentially some abuse of vulnerable adults uh, happening. And we're going to talk about what extortion looks like in this context in just a second. But if you are out there, and if this isn't your department, but you know someone um, who Null could contact, and you don't want to contact Null, if you want to send something to me, 
send something to me and I'll pass the information along. But uh, I know that, you know, different different departments have different specialties and jurisdictions. So if you uh, if you know someone who's involved in extortion or abuse of vulnerable adults at the federal level, uh, you know, and you want to get me their contact information, I can get them to null as well. And uh, he is willing. My understanding is he is willing to present all of the evidence that they have. So uh, that is, of course, between them and you. I'm just relaying that message. If this, guys, if this is true, this is messed up. Really, really terrible stuff. And uh, and it needs to be stopped if not people convicted for crimes. I think maybe there are some convictions in here, but it definitely needs to stop because uh, we have a clear victim and um, no one deserves that sort of victimhood just for the pleasure of other people. And and I, I'm tempted to call it the sick pleasure of the viewers, but... Until this came out, most viewers probably had no idea anything like this was going on. So all they know is that they're they're watching a guy. They find his ridiculous antics to be entertaining and insane and all of that. And then now it turns out that that guy might actually be being extorted and injured. And that's that's a problem. All right. On to the legal analysis of this stuff. So, again. Chris Chan is located in Virginia. So I have the Virginia extortion statute right here. This is what constitutes extortion in Virginia, and it's pretty broad. Any person who, one, threatens injury to the character, person, or property of another person. Two, accuses him of any offense. Three, threatens to report him as being illegally present in the United States. Or four, knowingly destroys, conceals, removes, confiscates, withholds, or threatens to withhold, or possesses any actual or purported passport or other immigration document or other actual or purported government identification document of another person and thereby, thereby, so all of those one, two, three, four categories uses one of those things or more to extort money, property, or pecuniary benefit of any note, bond, or other evidence of debt from him or any other person is guilty of a Class 5 felony. For the purpose of this section, injury to property includes a sale, distribution, or release of identifying information, so like doxing, um, defined in Clause 3 through uh, 12 of Subsection C, but of 182-186.3, but does not include the distribution or release of such information excuse me by a person who does so with the intent to obtain money property or pecuniary benefit to which he reasonably believes he is lawfully entitled so this is a weird exception to the law this exception does not apply to any of this so for the purposes of this case ignore this section okay because it contradicts what the court says here because it's talking about something completely different. So I don't want that to be a confusing factor uh, to the next thing I'm going to say. So what is extortion? Um, I have a couple different cases and I've highlighted the relevant sections. So this first one, this is Virginia extortion. This case, this case is not actually an extortion case. This is a RICO case. Uh, Smithfield Foods Incorporated versus United Food and Commercial Workers International Union. And they bring this RICO case, but a RICO case requires, uh, under the section that they bring this, uh, the RICO case requires an extortion statute from a state to be applied um, as a short summary. But here's the relevant part. On this case, it's very short. The Virginia courts are equally clear that the wrongfulness requirement of extortion does not require that the aim of the extortionate scheme be unlawful. Indeed, the Virginia courts have explicitly re rejected any claim of right defense to a charge of civil extortion. So what they're saying here is that the person trying to get something out of the extortion victim doesn't have, the government doesn't have to prove that what they're getting out of them is illegal. Let's say someone owes you $1,000. And you say, pay me my $1,000. And they say, no. And you have a contract. You have everything signed off. And you say, listen, buddy, I'm going to come over there and I'm going to break your arm. Or maybe it's a little bit better. Maybe you say, listen, I'm going to tell everybody that you're a pedophile and that you've been stalking your neighbor's daughter. Okay? 
if you don't pay me that thousand dollars. Now this person making the threat has every single right we can imagine to that thousand dollars and the other person not paying them is in the wrong. But the moment you add a threat to try and gain a monetary property or pecuniary benefit, pecuniary means basically something of value. Um, the moment you do that to gain that benefit, you go into extortion. So it doesn't have to be unlawful. So if Stephen Boyd and Joshua Wise want to come up with some sort of defense, like, well, Chris Chan owes us a bunch of money or things because of things that we did for him, like we did uh, artwork for him or we gave him story ideas for Sonichu, that doesn't matter. They can't extort someone by threatening damage to person, property, or reputation. And uh, by having Chris record videos and then taking those videos and saying, look, we'll distribute these to the public. If you don't do that, if you don't, if you don't give us GameStop gift cards and stuff like that, that's, I mean, pretty clearly extortion. Okay, so then a little bit later, an intent to steal is not, however, an element of extortion. So again, they don't have to try and steal something. They just have to be gaining money. Gaining a benefit, money, property, or pecuniary benefit. The absence of any such claim of right defense. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> <Whew>. <laughs> I had my cat out today. The absence of any such claim of right defense demonstrates that under the Virginia extortion statute, the lawfulness of the demanded object is irrelevant. Therefore, an extortionate means is sufficient to establish liability under the Virginia code. So there isn't an easy defense. Again, they can't claim some sort of employment or something like that. Doesn't work in this case. So the next case is Jeremy Dion Diamio versus the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I have a couple different things here, but it's summarized, if I remember right, right up front. Uh, oh no, that's the federal case. So bear with me. This one is not. So this is a little more thorough explanation of what ex extortion is. This person was charged with ex attempted extortion uh, but the elements for attempted crimes are the same elements as for actually committing the crime. The only difference is that they don't actually commit the crime because it's, it's foiled in some way, typically or spoiled at the last moment. But, uh, all of the elements of the crime leading up to the commission of the act are fulfilled. That's how attempt is proven. So an attempted extortion explanation is sufficient to talk about extortion. So just so there's no... Uh, confusion there. So what is a threat under the extortion statute? A threat is a communication relaying an intention to injure another's person or property, which taken in context, and this is, this is kind of important, reasonably causes the listener to believe that the speaker will carry out his intention. In determining whether the words were uttered as a threat, the context in which they were spoken must be considered. The court, as a result, must view the totality of the circumstances under which the statement was made. A threat need not be direct. It may be a veiled statement, nonetheless implying injury to the recipient when viewed in all the surrounding circumstances. So I am not aware of the exact statements made by, uh, allegedly made by Stephen Boyd and Joshua Wise. I haven't seen them. Um, Null and his crew have apparently seen them, but I have not. So I can't say for sure if it is, but under this standard, it's a very broad standard. If the threat doesn't have to be direct, like for example, in Minnesota, when you have a, a threat of violence, that threat has to be direct and specific. It can't be inferred or implied. For example, I will chop your head off could be a direct threat of violence. I'm going to put you in the ground even though the implicit meaning of that is that you're going to bury someone because they're dead, that's not really a direct threat of violence because it's, it's not specific enough. In contrast to that, under Virginia's extortion code, it is a very broad, uh, very broad thing and the context matters. So um, as long as these guys are communicating a threat, listen, if you don't send us money, we will release this videos, these videos, or we will, if you don't send us money, um, the moon is going to nuke Sana Chu's hometown and kill him. That actually could be a threat. Uh, you know, so there's that. 
Appellate's, appellant's intent. So this is the intent standard and in, in how they determine it. Intent is the purpose formed in a person's mind, which may and often must be inferred from the facts and circumstances in a particular case. The state of mind of an accused may be shown by his acts and conduct. This is contrary to what Comey said on Capitol Hill. And Trey Gowdy very accurately corrected James Comey uh, about how you determine intent by using circumstantial evidence and testimony. Uh, so here we go. Circumstantial evidence is as competent as direct evidence. Um, if you don't know, direct evidence would be, I intend to do something. Circumstantial evidence would be, here's a bunch of circumstances that lead us to a very, very conclusive inference that the person intended to do said thing. Okay. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to rob a bank. Buying a ski mask, carrying a duffel bag, writing a note that says, I want to uh, turn over all the money, driving to the bank, and standing in line at the bank. Those are circumstantial evidences uh, that someone has um, an intent to rob that bank. Okay. <laughs> so I hope that, hope that clarifies that if you're not aware. So in order to prove attempted extortion, the Commonwealth was required to establish that the defendant had the specific intent to commit extortion. So they do have to intend to get the benefit because of the threat. That's what committing extortion is. So just be clear on that when you understand what the specific intent is talking about. They have to want to gain the benefit and they have to make the threat. Viewed as a whole, the evidence clearly proves, so in this, this particular case, uh, viewed as a whole, the evidence clearly proves that appellant's intent was to wrongfully remove and retain the records and files of S&M to use the removal as a threat to the company to forgive his outstanding debt. Therefore, the trial court's finding that the, finding that the element of intent had been satisfied with regard to all charges is supported by evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. This case, I'm using it because if you read this case, there is not a direct threat made um, over messages. Let's see. Here are the, here are the quotes. Uh, he would be willing to provide the files to the company under the right circumstances. He would return the files in exchange for forgiveness of the debt. Those are his direct quotes. Uh, don't bother looking for the files because they're not there. Um, and then he, yeah, he removed files to a server that he only, only he had access to. So, I mean, there's no direct threat. There's certainly no violent threat. There's barely even a threat to communication, but uh, he is threatening to withhold this property, in this case, computer files, uh, from this company if they don't do what he wants, confer a benefit of a $6,000 debt forgiveness. The reason I use this case is because taking the hypothetical situation we have, this shows a much weaker case for extortion than the hypothetical Chris Chan case. Okay, so that's the Virginia statute. That's the Virginia statute and the Virginia standards that they use. Um, Let's see, the punishment for conviction of a felony. Okay, so extortion in Virginia is a class five felony. So the punishment here uh, in under Virginia law would be a term of imprisonment of not less than one year, not more than 10 years, or in the discretion of the jury or the court trying the case without a jury, confinement in jail for not more than 12 months and a fine of not more than 2,500, either or both. So it'd be one to 10 years, unless the jury or judge exercise their discretion if there is no jury and, and give them less a reduced sentence of 12 months or less. Now, what I don't know and can't easily tell you is if the total, the totality of their acts constitute one extortive act. I don't think so. I think actually each item or each threat that resulted in the attempt to gain something from Chris would be a separate count of extortion. And they could be convicted on any one or multiple of those. And each one would carry the same, uh, would carry that sentence and it would stack up. Okay, so let's say they got 10 gift cards after making 10 threats. That's 10 to 100 years in prison uh, or at the discretion of the court anytime 12 months or fewer, of course, could be applied. Um, but there are the potential for multiple felony charges of extortion under the Virginia Code. So let's, let's be clear on that. 
Now, Virginia seems like they could possibly prosecute these guys. They maybe they would have to extradite them because they're not in Virginia. So they would have to make a request to the law enforcement of other states to arrest these guys and ship them out. That might be impractical. Whether Virginia would make the prosecution or not is irrelevant, however, as there is a federal statute that covers this specific type of extortion. And this is this becomes federal when it crosses state lines. So this is uh, interstate communications. Section 875, 18 U.S. Code, eight, Section 875. One second. Mm. Bourboned up. All right, so Section A. Whoever transmits in interstate or foreign commerce any communication containing any demand or request for a ransom or reward for the release of any kidnapped person shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 20 years or both. That one probably doesn't really apply here. Whoever, with intent to extort from any person, firm, association, or corporation, any money or other thing of value, transmit in interstate or foreign commerce any communication containing any threat to kidnap any person or any threat to injure the person of another, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 20 years or both. Most likely, this doesn't apply. Most likely. But again, I'm not subject to the communications. So the question would be if these guys threatened to kidnap Chris Chan or if they threatened to harm Chris Chan or if they threatened to kidnap or harm someone Chris Chan uh, was interested in protecting. I mean, he doesn't necessarily have to be interested in protecting. They could just say, we're going to harm someone if you don't do this. That uh, is, is a violation here. And the really interesting question would be they did post a picture threatening Sonichu. Now, if they know that Chris Chan personifies Sonichu as a real entity, it's possible. It's possible the court could convict under this because in uh, this is my understanding has been applied only in cases of child pornography, um, an illustrated character uh, that re resembles the likeness of a person can be considered child pornography in a weird way. I'm not going to get super into that. And it's kind of a fringe theory. I don't think it would apply in this case, but it is possible that, uh, that a court could attempt to use Chris's understanding of Sonichu, uh, being, being a real thing or that he is part of Sonichu. Um, they could potentially use that to establish that these guys threatening Sonichu was actually a threat to a real person. So it'd be a weird theory. I don't know that it would go over well with a jury, but you know, this is a hypothetical anyway. Whoever transmits in interstate or foreign commerce, any communication containing any threat to kidnap any person or to, or any threat to injure the person of another shall be fined under this title uh, or imprisoned not more than five years or both. So this one is, um, this one's weird because this one is a threat. This is not an extortion. Uh, there's no threat. There's no request for money involved here. So then finally, back to the final extortion offense. Whoever with intent to extort from any person, firm, association, or corporation any money or other thing of value transmits in interstate or foreign commerce any communication containing any threat to injure the property or reputation of the addressee or of another, or the reputation of a deceased person, or any threat to accuse the addressee or any other person of a crime, should be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than two years or both. This one almost definitely applies. Uh, based on the hypothetical that we have, um, they have threatened to, by threatening to release the videos, uh, they have threatened to injure the reputation of the addressee by threatening to release a video of him punching his mother uh, or accusing him of punching his mother. That is that is accusing him of committing a crime. That would be domestic violence. So this would apply. This is the most likely section. And again, it would be up to the federal uh, prosecutors. But I believe that each specific threat uh, with an attempt to extort money would be an individual act and therefore an individual charge. 
If it was one threat for a whole bunch of different things, that's a little different. But in this case, it seems like an ongoing thing where they would get something, wait a little bit, threaten something else. Get something, wait a little bit, threaten something else. So these are distinct crimes and distinct acts. Uh, and, and those crimes would have distinct defenses as well. So that's that's part of it. They're not going to be all lumped together. Um, that's that's where we are. Okay, so how do the feds interpret this? Uh, this is, they interpret extortion in the same way as Virginia. Everybody interprets extortion the same way. There's got to be a threat. There has to be the intent to threaten and the intent to receive the property. Those things have to be proven. This talks about that. And this is the only potential complicating factor that I can see based on the information is that Stephen Boyd and Joshua Wise, if they are autistic, uh, the, the defense for them might be that they're incapable of reasonably conveying a threat or acting with the intent to convey a threat. I don't think that defense would hold based on what I've been told are in the chat logs. I don't think so. However, it is possible that they could try. I mean, they, if I was their lawyer, I would definitely use that defense it may not hold up. And based on what I've been told, but again, can't verify, uh, I don't think it would. But here's the summary. Here's the summary of everything. This is the important part of how the federal law or of how federal law treats this. Section 875C's mental state requirement. So this is a little different because this is C. Uh, this is transmitting and uh, Interstate or foreign commerce, any communication containing any threat to kidnap any person or threat to injure the person of another. But extortion is going to have the same, it's going to have the same mental state thing under this in 875C as it would A, B, and D. So uh, we're going to go ahead and use this as it's informative. So section 875C's mental state requirement is satisfied if the defendant transmits a communication for the purpose of issuing a threat or with knowledge that the communication will be viewed as a threat. So in this case, the petitioner, so again, um, they have to, they have to intend to communicate the threat and they have to intend that the communication will be viewed as a threat. So petitioner was convicted of violating this provision under instructions that required the jury to find he has communicated what a reasonable person would regard as a threat. That's not the standard. The court is making a distinction here. They're not using what a reasonable person would regard as a threat. It's what the person doing uh, the threatening is intending. It's their specific intent, their mens rea, their criminal mind. Okay. Uh, this case is kind of actually really interesting about what you shouldn't post on Facebook. So an individual who, quote, transmits an in interstate or foreign commerce, any communication containing any threat to kidnap any person or threat to injure the person of another is guilty of a felony and faces up to five years imprisonment. The statute requires that a communication be transmitted and that the communication contain a threat. It does not specify that the defendant must have any mental state with respect to these elements. In particular, it does not indicate whether the defendant must intend that his communication contains a threat. So the court is just laying out that there's no specific uh, intent requirement in the statute. However, uh, it does find that, um, and the court find, of course, the court finds its own authority to write, to read that into the statute, but, um, it does find that. So, uh, next quote here is, this is not to say that a defendant must know that his conduct is illegal before he may be found guilty. The familiar maxim, ignorance of the law is no excuse, typically holds true. Instead, our cases have explained that a defendant generally must quote, know the facts that make his conduct fit the definition of the offense, even if he does not know that those facts give rise to a crime. So these guys might try and use the defense that they didn't know what they were doing was wrong, but that doesn't matter. Like, they, they can't understand that it's a crime to threaten someone to get money. That is irrelevant. The only thing that has to uh, happen is that we have to show, we, the people, as they prosecute these people, have to show that these guys intended to convey a threat to Chris Chan for the purpose of getting something back. That's what has to be shown. Not that they knew that that was wrong. And I think that's going to be the big, uh, that's going to be where you overcome any possible autism or mental deficiency defense 
that these guys didn't know what they were doing was wrong is irrelevant. And sometimes that is relevant. Here it is not. Yeah, I said that right, I think. Anyway, federal criminal liability generally does not turn solely on the results of an act without considering the defendant's mental state. That understanding took deep and early root in American soil, and Congress left it intact here. Under Section 875C, wrongdoing must be conscious to be criminal. Again, they must not be consciousness that they are doing something wrong. They just must be conscious that they are doing the thing that is wrong, if that makes sense, that they're committing the act. So that is the federal uh, intent standard that is applied to this. Again, basing purely on taking this hypothetical as true, it sure looks like Chris Chan is the victim of ex extortionists. It, it, there may be some compounding factors since he is probably classifiable as a vulnerable adult if he if, if he actually has the autism that is alleged. There are real questions about whether or not his mother should be in charge. I don't know anything about the evidence uh, of her taking his SSDI, but you know if if there is someone uh, some of that involved and if they have if if these guys have evidence. They should probably report that to um, the Virginia has a vulnerable adult assistance center that would uh, would take would potentially offer legal help and, and guardianship to someone like Chris Chan. Whether or not Chris Chan would want that is a separate thing. So uh, that would be that would be up to a lot of other people to decide. But, you know, if they're if that's happening, if if his mother is taking his money that is his uh, living income, and she doesn't have some justification for it, that's probably uh, abusing a vulnerable adult. Um, but uh, these these other guys, Stephen Boyd and Joshua Wise, clearly, based on the hypothetical, would be guilty of extortion, and that would potentially be compounded by that. So, if anyone out there is a Virginia law enforcement officer, which I know is a long stretch, uh, and once information on this, contact me, contact Null. Um, if you contact me, I'll, I'm basically just going to forward you to Null because I can't do any of this. But if you don't want to contact him directly or don't have the means to, um, you can easily contact me through my channel or any of the social media stuff. If you guys care about Chris Chan, if you care about the abuse of trans people, if you care about the abuse of autistic people, any of those things, if they're, if you're, connected to advocacy groups who are will, willing to help and at least take a look at this um you know maybe maybe pass the information along send this video to them i don't care uh how you do it but um there's someone who appears to be a victim uh two people who may not know what they're doing is wrong and if that's the case then fine they can deal with the law has tools to deal with that but if that's not the case they know what they're doing is wrong they need to be convicted if they don't know what they're doing is wrong, they need to be stopped because no one should be a victim. Um, and and it, the fact that uh, internet culture has created this uh, this chain of abuse for entertainment, but no one knows it's going on, is one of those things that um, that needs to be checked every now and then. And uh, if if these guys are doing that, uh, then pass it along. If you're a federal law enforcement officer. Uh, you know, I would typically say don't ever talk to me, but um, <laughs> if you do uh, watch this channel as a federal law enforcement officer and you know someone who is involved in these types of cases, interstate commerce extortion cases or, uh, you know, vulnerable adult protection, please contact me and I will get you in touch with Null or contact him directly if you know how to do that, uh, you know, and, and they can present the evidence. I mean, maybe there's Maybe there's nothing there, but maybe there's something. And if it is, let's uh, let's get you guys doing something good. <laughs> that wasn't the sl yeah. It was a little bit of a slam. I apologize, but uh, yeah, let's let's focus that energy towards helping someone who needs it. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching this. Um, if I get more information about this, I will continue on. I don't have plans to do a series on this. Uh, I, some other Chris Chan content has been requested of me by various people. So if you want to see that content, if you want to see more about this, um, 
watch the video, share the video, uh, drop me comments and let me know that this is something you're interested in. If I get more information, I'd be happy to have it. Uh, maybe I can interview Null sometime and talk about things. You know, that is all possible. What you guys want to see involving Chris Chan, if you communicate it to me, then I'll know you want it and then I'll be happy to provide it. But um, this is so far, I, you know, again, I'm not a Chris Chan fan or critic or troll. I know very little about him outside of this. And, uh, and, and so it's kind of outside of my scope. But if you want to see some more stuff uh, and you show that to me, I'd be happy to provide more content in that vein um, and dig down further into this stuff as well. Like we could do another video on the vulnerable adult stuff. You guys let me know. I'm going to stop babbling. I'm going to stop babbling. If you like this, share it, like it, send it out, um, you know, tweet it, whatever. Uh, and, and then I'll know. All right, guys. I'm going to peace out. It's getting a little late for me. And I'm going to go uh, go to bed, I guess. Because that sounds exciting. So you guys have a great night. Um, I hope this video finds you well and you find it entertaining. And I will talk to you very soon. Have a good one.